Coming to you live from the Blighted Reach, this is Optimal Play, I'm Brandon. I'm Jordan. And I'm Drew. And I don't know how to play the campaign expansion to ARCs. What should we do about that, Jordan? We're going to teach you right now at 10.30 at night. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. Right after finishing a game of ARCs, the best possible environment. Exactly. I'm sure that will yeah, retain yeah, yeah. all of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is uh, what, I, what we've been calling a casual how to play, which means it's not scripted and it's not going to be fancy with a lot of B-roll. Uh, we just happen to have Jordan, who is a, a, a skilled game teacher here. Thank you. And we've identified the need that there doesn't seem to be any how to play content on YouTube yet for the Blighted Reach campaign expansion to ARCs. Right. And also, I would like to try the campaign someday, so I will be actually learning as we go. And you can always watch this video back for reference. Uh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> actually, <laughs> if you, So you don't, don't feel the pressure to retain all of it right now. Huh. I have never yet pulled up one of our own Learn to Play videos for my own learning. Yeah. Like, I mean, refreshing, I guess but I could see it here, actually. Yeah. <laughs> if you're learning in a few months, there might be another video out there that you might prefer. Who's to say? I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah. So, this is ARC's uh, The Blighted Reach campaign. Mm -hmm. It is an expansion to ARC's that transforms the game from a single session game to a three session game. Each of the three sessions is called an act. And in between acts, there is some falling action, some new setup for the next act, some story beats happen, and then you move into the next act, play through it, and then you do it again for the third. And only at the end of the third act do you actually figure out who's won the entire campaign. Oh, so each act does not have a winner? Each act does not have a winner. Interesting, okay. Um, yeah. And the there's no requirement that you play this uh, over three sessions or over one session. It's very flexible. So you can play it all sitting down in one TI4-like day, or you can <laughs> play it in three game nights, however you want to do it. Um, so this is what the board will look like at the very beginning of setup. Basically, we've randomly decided that the Imperium starts here in sectors five and six, and there's blight everywhere else. We should... These I, are these purple I, I'm wishing right now that I had said more clearly, if you're looking to learn the base game of Arcs, you're in the wrong place. Right. We're, we're assuming that you know it. Right. And, and you're looking to, to, you've played it at least once and right. are looking to try the campaign. There are various teaches for that, including in the archive of stream videos for this channel where we taught you base arcs several hours ago. Uh, that's true. Yeah. Um, so, right, so this is the, the starting setup. We have these Imperium ships, we have these Blight, and these Blight are damaged. Um, like most components in the game, they're two sides and they're damaged. All damaged. Sure, that makes sense. Um, okay. And then we as players are essentially going to arrive into this portion of space where the Empire is fairly weak. And we will all arrive as Imperial Regents. We'll have these status cards that say Imperial Regents. But we're here for ourselves. We're not here for the Imperium. And um, we uh, will arrive and, and we'll have certain goals that we wish to accomplish. So okay. the very first thing you're going to do after you do this sort of basic setup stuff is you're going to draw two fates from uh, the fate deck. There are A fates, B fates, and C fates. And in Act 1, you're going to draw two A fates. And each player is going to do this. And then each player is going to look at their fates and pick one. Mm. So perhaps, Brandon, you would like to be that fate. And perhaps, Drew, you'd like to be that one, I suppose. Sure. Um, and so... Then we'd all reveal our fates, so go ahead and reveal. I'm the Founder. And, and I am the Admiral. Excellent. So these fates have a few pieces of information. This is a little flavor text about what it's going to be like. And then these are your this is your path to power, meaning this is what you'll be doing in Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. Oh, interesting. If you choose to stay with this fate, which you may not. You hmm. may switch. And then there's a complexity rating in the bottom uh, bottom corner there. Founder's a little more complicated, so I gave it to Drew. All right. <laughs> then what you're going to do is you're going to take the deck of cards that was pre-sorted in the box mm -hmm. that corresponds to your fate. So this is the Founder deck for Drew. And we did not get out the Admiral deck for you, but that is okay. And what you're basically oh, going to do... that's a deck specific to the fate. I right. See. So this wow. says Founder Act 1. Okay. And if you piece through this, you'll see there's, you know, Founder... Eventually you get to Founder Act 2. Mm. So if you stick with Founder into Act 2, this will be the relevant stuff. So in this act, we're only going to see this portion of the deck. And so the very first card in that is going to be a setup card. And it's going to tell you exactly what to do. This says Gain Parade Fleets, which is card 2 in this. So you, Drew would gain this card, Parade Fleets. And then flip this card over. And now, on this side of the card, you're going to see a time rating. And uh, basically, this is an objective card. So this says, in a three-player game, which we'll pretend this is, uh, there's a time value of 16. So Drew's going to take his little circular disc, uh, which is actually over here, yep. and he's going to set it to 16. 
Okay. Oh, you just you use the power track at the bottom for this. Right. Okay. And then you'll still have zero power to start because you've got 16 on this track. And then there are conditions on this card that tell you how to tick this timer down. Hmm. Okay. And so this says, while you're an outlaw, which we'll cover later, advance three time for each ambition you win. At the end of the chapter, if you're an outlaw, advance one time for each system you control. And advance means reduce. It means it reduce. On the track. Okay. Right. And so at the end of the chapter, first of all, I mean, there'll be consequences for if you failed or succeeded by getting to zero. Zero mm. is success. Um, but one of the consequences, well, we'll cover the consequences later, actually. I don't want to get into that right now. But what this is like sort of your primary goal for the scenario, or a major goal for you, is to advance this timer down. And that's mm. going to be set by this fate. And then. Also in this pile of cards, you're going to have this wait to resolve this until the intermission. The intermission being the time between Act 1 and Act 2. And it says, if you completed your objectives, and you get these uh, you get these instructions. And if you fail your objective, you get these instructions instead. And would you recommend reading this before you start the game? It's or? up to you. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can. I think if you want to be surprised, you don't have to. Um, but if you want to know, like, for instance, Founder has this card that you get if you complete your objective that is somewhat polarizing. It's mm -hmm. called the Book of Liberation, and it can be good or bad, and you may not want it for your campaign. Oh, interesting. So you might decide that you don't want to succeed at this hmm. particular uh, fate. Okay, so that's all going to happen during setup. Everyone's going to go through their deck. You might get one or two cards. Maybe some cards will be shuffled into here. There might be other instructions on that fate card. And then... In player order, we're going to do a snake draft for these building slots. And so basically mm. what you're going to do is you're going to get one building uh, on anything in here, uh, any of the Imperium slots. So I could go here, and I would get three ships along with that, and I get one resource of that planet type. So I'd get a relic. And then Drew will do it, then you would do it, and then you do it twice and we'd go around. And at the end of that, any still vacant planet spots go to free cities. They become okay. free cities, which are these neutral cities yeah. that come into the game. Um, and with that done, we'll basically be set up. We'll each have two resources, we'll each have two buildings, we'll each have uh, six ships on the map, we'll be ready to play. And is it, it's not two cities, it's your choice? Your choice you build of buildings. Of, of, uh, yeah, each time you build okay. one, it's your choice. Um, and so that is essentially the, uh, the setup for Act 1. So now let's go through the differences. And like Brandon said, we're not going to cover the base rules of the game. Mm -hmm. We're only going to cover the things that are different. And so, uh, and I'll point out actually, the game does come with, although I don't have one here, these lovely player aids that just explain the differences, basically, oh, between the, the base that's cool. campaign game. Okay, so I think the first thing to talk about are these Empire ships, these Imperial ships. Um, so, as I noted, we're all going to start the game as Imperial Regents. These ships are going to respond to whether you're an Imperial Regent or you change to become an outlaw. So... Mm -hmm. If you are an Imperial Regent, you are subject to three laws. And I remember those laws. They are the laws <laughs> of control, movement, and harm, right? Sure, yeah. I think the names might be different, but that's essentially Okay. That's essentially <laughs> so if you're a Regent, on your turn, you control these ships where you have at least one loyal ship. So what that means is you can battle with hmm. them. You can move with them. However, if you move with them, you must move one of your ships for each Imperial ship you move. So if mm -hmm. I wanted to move two Imperial ships, I'd also have to move two of my own ships. Um, you may tax with them. Basically, you control them for all intents and purposes on your turn. Okay, and you don't have to control the space they were in. You just had to have a loyal ship there. That's right. Okay. Because, go ahead. No, that's a good point. Because uh, the Empire actually controls any space there's at least one fresh ship. Right. So as oh. long as there's one, and so they're kind of like bigger ships too. Right. They're yeah. supposed to represent like even more of a fleet. So here where there's three yellow and the one purple Imperial ship, this is controlled by the Imperium? It's controlled by the Imperium. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. That's right. Um, so, right. Players only control systems that have no Imperial ships hmm. in them. Or if you're an outlaw, no, it doesn't matter. If the Imperium's there, they hmm. control. Um, okay. And so on your turn, you control the Imperium ships and you may act with them as long as you have a loyal piece there. Okay. Um, so you can move with them, you can battle with them, etc. You, however, are restricted from harming the Imperium and members of the Imperium, meaning your fellow mm. regions. So harm in this game means removing a piece, targeting for battle, etc. Um, taxing. 
Oh. Uh, and so you cannot do any of those things to one of your fellow regents if the Imperium is there watching. So in this case, if I had three ships in here and there's one Imperial ship, I can't, and Drew has, you know, one less ship, let's say. Mm -hmm. Normally I'd be able to tax his city. I can't, because the Imperium is watching. Normally I'd be able to battle Drew. I can't, because the Imperium is watching. You get the picture. Can you still tax loyal cities if the Imperium is there? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, and so... Right, exactly. So you can't tax rivals, right? Right. Um, if the Imperium is watching, so that those are the rules of control and harm, and I already covered the rule of movement as well. So those are the three Imperium rules. Is there anything that we missed about control of Imperium pieces? Mm, no, I think that's it. Okay. So that is the story with uh, with these. Uh, now I will say, if you become an outlaw, uh, the Imperium is your enemy, and so they mm. can do anything to you, and you can do anything to them. And in fact, you can target either a player, and if, a, if you target a player and there's an Imperium ship there, that ship is included in your fight, or you can target just the Empire and mm. just attack these purple ships, and that is an option available to you as an outlaw. Wait, so uh, wait, as an outlaw, they're, they are included in the fight as essentially a rival ship for the fight? Like you can deal damage to them? Yes. Okay, they're not, they don't join you for the fight like if you were not an outlaw. Correct. Got it. And then there's one other important rule around movement with these ships relating to catapult moves. Mm. So as you know, catapult moves end um, where there is a rival player, right? right. However, a rival... So uh, let's say Drew and I are both regents, and I'm here, and Drew wants to catapult through this gate. Drew cannot catapult through this gate if he is bringing only his own ships. However, as long as he has a complement of at least one Imperial ship, this is considered a mixed group, and so he can catapult through a gate that I control. Hmm. Because, because as soon as it's there, oh, and because as soon as the ship is there, he doesn't control it, Correct. Hmm. Correct. And none of that obviously applies to outlaws. So outlaws sure. don't participate in the same way. Um, and then Imperium ships also block outlaws from catapult moving. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to transition into Blight, and the first place to start is that Blight will never control a space, but it does block catapult moves. So if you move into a spot that has Blight, your movement ends. Mm. The second thing to note about Blight is that Blight has this little shield on it, meaning it is tough. So you may target Blight for an attack, however, it requires two hits to deal one damage to the Blight. Mm. So two hits would remove this, but one would do nothing. And on its healthy side, it would take two hits to flip it and a further two to remove it. Um, and just like anything else, these Blight can be taken as trophies. Um, so that is generally what Blight does uh, during our player turns. There are times when Blight will strike back. We'll cover that a little bit later. Uh, finally, we have these free cities. Um, you are able to tax free cities that you control, and it works the same way. You get a resource. You do not get a captive. Hmm. You are also able to raid free cities. If you do, you can spend up to one key for one resource of that type from the bank, provided one is available. Oh, okay. So you maximum get one key's worth that's, of resources. Okay, that's the extent raiding. of the upside of keys from raiding. That's mm -hmm. right, from raiding free cities. There are also free starports, although none start on the map. And if you control a free starport, you can build with it. And catapult from it. And mm -hmm. catapult from it, exactly right. And if you, so if you're raiding, or I guess even doing battle where there's a free city, can you destroy it, and does it outrage yes. that resource? Okay. Outrage will work the same way. Yeah, only if you're targeting it directly. Like, if you're targeting another player, they're unaffected. Oh, it's not like you may end up having to apply hits to no, it. No, 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 yeah. No, 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 yeah. Okay, so that is generally the new pieces that are on the board. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing that I said I'd cover, and I just want to make sure that I'm not missing anything, but I don't think I am, <laughs> is, um, yeah, okay are uh, the event cards. So new to the deck, which would be the normal action deck that you'd have, so in a three-player game, two through six, and a four-player game, one through seven, there are gonna be two or three um, of these event cards. Is it always two? Uh, I think three in a four-player game. Three in a four-player game, that's what I thought. Numbers, yeah, okay. So these event cards get dealt out in the hands, and so they'll be, they have the same back, they'll be in your hand just like any other card. And the way these cards work is, First, you can't lead with them. Can't lead with an event card. Okay. But let's say someone leads with, you know, a two of construction, you can play an event card uh, as your follow. 
And when you do that, you get to take actions like the lead card. So I would basically get four construction hmm. pips. So that's a pretty strong effect, right? Um, unless a rival already played an event this phase. So if someone goes ahead and plays a second event, they can't do that anymore. They don't hmm. get the four, right? What do so they do then? Nothing. It's just blank. Yeah. So don't. Oh. Do, but so probably. There, there's a small case where you'd want to do that, but hmm. you probably don't want to. Um, okay. You also cannot use this card to copy, hmm. and you cannot use this card to seize. So if you have this card, it is going to get played face up in in the uh, trick and That's not just... as a lead honor system i guess that you don't use it to copy yep yeah hmm. um okay so that's what happens when you play it but at the end of the round something special happens there is going to be a uh summit and an event phase so at the end of the round after we figure out who gets initiative so let's say brandon that you surpassed and you played a three and mm -hmm. so with it you got the initiative you have the option to call a summit because this event card was played into this trick and you won, you get to call a summit if you wish. So the rules for a summit are as follows. First, well, there's a lot to talk about here. <laughs> um, okay. So first, you may have acquired at some point during the game favors. Favors come in the form of these agents and they will sit on your fate card. So maybe you have one of my favors. Hmm. The first thing that happens in a summit is that you can spend my favors to do certain things, to force me to do certain things. The things you can spend that favor to make me do are make one of my pieces one of your pieces instead. Whoa. Make, right, either here or an agent on the court. You can also ask me for a resource, but that will cost favors equal to the keys. Um, you can... Force me, if you're a regent and I'm an outlaw, to become a regent. What else can oh. I do? There's one other thing. Um, I don't have a player aid here. <laughs> um, and when you say... Um, you can... When you say you can, you there is just the leader who just, called the summit? Just whoever called the summit, which would be... Which would be the, won, the new leader the new from, leader from the, the next round trick. that right. the event was played. Okay. So the player who called the summit can spend these favors to do these things. Um, the other thing you can do is take a captive or a trophy um, that I have. So it's captive, trophy, okay. or resource. The resources cost keys. Um, okay. And in fact, you can only invite me to the Empire if you're the first regent, which we haven't talked about. We'll come back to this mm -hmm. piece a little bit mm -hmm. later. Um, okay. But in any event you can spend that favor to force one of those negotiations on me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And all of those negotiations are things that if the summit is opened, we can freely discuss. So favors are like ways of forcing you oh. to give me stuff, but there's a there's a phase after this where people can just wheel and deal and be like, hmm. oh, maybe like you give me a ship here and I'll give you a resource for it or something. Oh, interesting. So okay. all of those options you can just freely trade. They're, they're sort of the parameters that this game allows you to trade. Right. Hmm. So that's that's the second phase of the summit. So if you call a summit, only the person who called it can return favors. Um, they can do one of, one or two other things here, which I'll mention really quickly in a moment. And then after that, all the players can take those negotiation actions. Okay. And do whatever they wish. Um, okay. I'm going to point out that the other things you can do as a person who called the summit, but I'll return to them in a moment... One of them is you can just become an outlaw. So if you want to become an outlaw, you can become <laughs> okay. an outlaw. That's, you can just that's, call, call a press conference yeah, to yeah, announce exactly. that you're an outlaw. Yeah, exactly. Leaving the empire. empire. Right. Um, yeah. And if there are no regents, if everyone's an outlaw, you can revive the empire by becoming a regent and you just become the first regent. Oh. The other thing you can do is if this card is on its purple side, which I'll explain how that happens later, you can flip it back to its white side. Okay. okay. This Imperial Council in session card. Imperial Council card. That's right. Hmm. And we'll cover that in a moment. All right, so that's the summit. Then you're going to roll these two dice, okay? And these two dice, this die just has a number on it, one through six. And this die has three sides that have this uh, sort of like scroll symbol. Mm -hmm. One of each with the three different modifiers for these, or oh, identifiers for these uh, different spaces. systems. Right, yeah. exactly. And then three that have this blight symbol, again, with the three different things. Hmm. So you'll roll this die as well, okay? And then, based on your roll, we are either going to do a, um, a uh, crisis phase, which is this symbol, or we're going to do a um, scroll phase, Edicts. an edict phase. So we're going to cover each of those now very briefly. Okay. Okay. So the, um, the edict phase is what we'll start with. 
you're going to have this little booklet and it's going to have all of your edicts in it. This is an amazing game component. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's this big accordion and on one side it has edicts and on the other side it has laws um, or rules modifiers basically. And so in the game, at the start of the game, no matter what, the base edict that you're going to have is you're going to have these three cards, which are edict number three, the govern cards, and you're going to have randomly one of them on top. Hmm. Okay. And what this edict does, for example, is it says the first regent must either enforce this policy or change to a new policy. So the first regent can either do this or change this to one of the other two options. Okay. Okay. Um, and what these basically are is they tax things from the regents and put them on the first regent tile, and then they bestow certain benefits. And it's unimportant to go over exactly what those are, but the point of this is that it is not the player who called the event that gets to make this decision, it's the first regent, hmm. and resources that are taxed go to this first regent tile, mm -hmm. the Imperial Trust. You can think of this as the Empire like setting their political agenda for the next phase of the game. Sure. Like they're, oh, are we escalating towards war? Are we in peace now? And there's sort of effects that, that trigger off of that. Exactly right. And um, yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty fun thing. I guess we can go over these in particular later if you'd like to. But these roles will add, you know, potentially new edicts into the game. And um. they, they will say exactly how they get resolved. So this one adds edict number 25. Each edict has a number in the top left, and that is the order in which you resolve them. Oh, so okay. this is number three. You know, you put that in, and then you do whatever mm. that says. When so as you add more, you probably like slot them around in that accordion so that they're in numerical order. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's uh, and then this you can pres preserve this between games by just plopping it in here, and then you're ready to go with all of your edicts for the next game because those last between games. Clever. Cool. All right. So that's how the edict phase works. The crisis phase instead has these blight dealing damage to ships. Hmm. So the damage blight deals one damage, that's why there's this little one on it. The healthy blight deals three damage. And they're gonna deal damage everywhere that there are ships. They do not deal damage to buildings. If there's an Imperium ship, they will deal damage to the Imperium ship first. If there are multiple player ships, they will deal that damage to each player. So in this case, we'd each suffer hmm. one damage. If, for instance, this was on its three side and this was already damaged, it would deal one da well, let's just say it's healthy. It would deal one damage to this Imperium ship, a second damage to this Imperium ship. There's one left over. We'll each take one of those. Oh, okay. Um, and that's only the case if we're both regents. If you're an outlaw, you take damage alongside the region, uh, the Empire ships. So in this case, if red is an outlaw, uh, purple would take three damage. One, two. Blue's a regent, so they'll take one. And then red will just take three because they're an outlaw in and of themselves. Okay. Um, so that's sort of how these blight deal damage. Do ships destroyed that way just go back to your supply? Yes. Okay. Um, and so that is what the blight phase does. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Okay. Was there any significance in any of that to the symbol, the, the, like the moon star yes. symbols on well, the, the Right. And okay. here's, and here's why. Yeah. Good, good question. So there, when you roll a crisis, there are actually three crises that you resolve. The Blight is the first crisis, and mm. there's going to be two more crises. And sometimes they care about this symbol. Ah, I see. Mm. So the second crisis is in the court. So you'll see this Vox card, for instance, has this box at the top that says Crisis. And so hmm. whenever there's a crisis, all of the crisis cards in the court will trigger, and you'll do what they say. And so this one says, in turn order, each player with more guild cards than agents in their supply must discard guild cards until their guild cards equal their agents. Hmm. So if you've overextended your court presence, you might get punished. But there are, for instance, cards like, I'm trying to find one that keys off that die. Um, oh, well, there are none in the base in deck, the base, but, but there are some in, in, some, uh, in some fate decks. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing that you do, the third crisis, is the personal player crisis. So there are cards that you will have in front of you that will also have crises, and those mm. trigger third. So the crisis is the blight, the court, and then your personal cards. And all of that only happens if the summit is called. No. And and the crisis is rolled. No, the well, no, there's a I, second I mean, way. No, uh, no, sorry, no, no, no. That right, sorry, no. The summit is the first choice mm -hmm. for the event card. You can choose to call summit or not, and then regardless of whether you call or summit, you roll these dice. And okay, and you do the edict, edict or the crisis. Or crisis. Got it. I right. see. In play, a lot of times we go like, oh, I don't need to do any summit things. Does anyone really want to trade? No. Okay, then let's just go straight to the roll. Right. Or better yet, 
I don't really want to do any summit things, and I know you guys do, but screw you. Sure. Let's go straight to uh, whatever. Okay. So there is a second way that this whole summit and uh, crisis or edict gets triggered other than through this event card. It's through this Imperial Council in session card. Mm. So this card is always out. There'll be four court cards like always, and then there will also be this card that you can influence and secure just like any other court card. And when you do secure it, it says, when secured, flip this card over to its Imperial Council decided side, and then tuck it partially under your played card so the title is showing. So for instance, you would tuck it under here, just like that. Hmm. And then at the end of this turn, at the end of this trick, whoever played it, they get to do this. So it's not whoever won. It might mm. be that someone else actually won the thing. But whoever, whoever secured this gets this bonus. And so what they can do is they may call a summit. Then if they're a regent, they become the first regent. Hmm. Then if they're... So that's a special thing. That's only on this. That's not in the general summit. Right, case. okay. If you're a regent, you can become the first regent, meaning you get this tile. Okay. If you're an outlaw, you may steal from the first regent tile. Ooh. So you can take these resources off of it. This, as many as you want? As many as you can fit? I think as many as you can fit, yeah, right? Um, I yeah. I think it is. Yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> on that. We, we haven't seen that happen. Okay, but refer, yeah. refer to your rule book for that, uh, mm -hmm. if and when it comes up. Okay. And then you must resolve either crises or edicts, but it's your choice. Oh, not a die roll you choose. Not a die roll. Okay. You get to choose. Okay, and then this card on its purple side, it says you cannot influence or secure this card. Now, you may flip this card to in session if you call a summit and petition the council. So one of the options, as a reminder, I said during the summit mm. phase is you can petition the council. When you get this card, it immediately comes back here, and it's your choice to leave it on the purple side or flip it over to the white side. When you call a summit. When you call a summit. And for anyone, maybe you want to leave it on the purple side because you just became the first region and you don't want someone to easily be able to take this back from you. So now the next time an event card is played, that player can call a summit and then flip this over. And now that's available again hmm. to be secured. Okay. Right? In theory. Okay. So that is, those are the two ways that that whole summit and then either edict or crisis event get triggered. Um, following all of that. Yeah. Did I miss anything on that, Drew? Uh, I think that's basically it, yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, one thing, we could maybe talk a little bit about the first region tile mm -hmm. and what these resources on here uh, do. So um, uh, certain edicts will tax resources from, uh, from regions and place them on this tile. If you have this tile in front of you, um, these resources on it are frozen, meaning you can't use them for mm -hmm. normal prelude actions or spend them on anything. But they do count for all scoring for you. Oh, as long as it's, so okay. it's really like powerful to be first region if there's like a lot of resources on here. Interesting, right? Yeah. Um, so, and that's it. Other than being stolen out of there by the outlaw, that's its sole yeah. purpose. Frozen, is... frozen. Like I don't think can be taken other than that outlaw Got um, okay. stealing right. as well. Although there may be and a fate that changes. Yeah, that. with the caveat that each fate has an elaborate deck of abilities and effects sure. that may yeah, break yeah, yeah. anything we've just talked about. Yeah, today. there's like cards break like rules in the text. There's sure. sort of that hierarchy yeah. in this game. Obviously. There is one exception. Silver Tongues, which is a base court and campaign court card that says you may discard this to steal a guild card or resource, does allow you to oh, take okay. the first region down. So, oh. um, this happens to be out there, so huh. there, there are okay. some ways, but generally speaking, you can't raid for those. Yeah. Well then, yeah, so, yeah, so, so how... Values so then the guild cards that let you steal, like, all the materials would be the same way? You steal from yeah, there, too? I guess, you, yeah. Uh, good question. Yeah, probably. probably. I would think so. It uses the same verbiage yeah, as yeah. That, that did. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think we're good to actually just talk about the end of the first act, and then we'll talk about acts two and three. Okay. So, at the end of the first act... What's going to happen is we're going to figure out the scoring situation. So let's say uh, Drew made it all the way down to one, but he just oh man, he just couldn't. Yeah, uh, he really blew it. Yeah. And then let's say that I, being you know an excellent player of this game, I I, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I killed it. All right. So what's going to happen here is the following: first, for every point you're shy of making it to zero, you just lose a point. For every like time you're shy, for every time you lose a power, you lose a power. Just, <laughs> yeah, just, <so>. not, <laughs> just not use point for both of those yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. For every yeah. time you're shy on your objective, you're going to lose one power. Okay. Then everyone is going to lose half their power, rounded down. So mm. I'm at fifteen. I would go down to uh, eight, and Drew's at eight. He'd go down to four. Okay. Then 
So, and that will be sort of the final score for the round. And then this uh, initiative for the next chapter will go to whoever has the highest power. So that okay. is the main advantage of winning Act 1 or 2, is you get to start the next act. Okay, now let's talk about what happens if you fail or succeed in your, um, your goal. Mm -hmm. okay. So regardless, you're going to go to your uh, resolution card and resolve the if you completed your objective, if you failed your objective steps. Um, so let's actually say that Drew completed this objective. He's going to gain the Book of Liberation. He's going to add the three political intrigue cards, which are these three, to the court deck, so they'll get shuffled in. Hmm. And then he's going to place the two construction union cards behind the next resolution card. So these are going to get pushed back. So it's going to say exactly oh. what to do on here. Okay. And if he failed, instead of getting this Book of Liberation card, he would scrap it, right? And so it would go out of the game. So different things will happen. And we haven't commented on, but uh, as you were setting this up, we chatted about it that, you, like, yes, these have different card backs, and you're still shuffling them together. Yeah, right? and you get in to a way see... that, that you do see what the back of the card coming up is. That's intentional. Yeah, yeah. it is. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's a cool little thing. Okay, then if you succeeded at your objective, right now you're going to draw one of the next objectives, so 1B. And then you're going to choose, do you want to persist with your current fate, mm. or do you want to transition to a new fate? Hmm. And so you can make that choice. If you failed your objective, you're instead going to draw, you, you can't continue with that objective. Oh. And you're going to draw two of the next objectives. Oh, I thought it was going to be that your reward is you can pivot, but it's actually your... You must pivot. You must pivot if yeah, you fail. must pivot. Your reward is you can stay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. okay. Right, right. So, the... Um, the difference between Act 2 and Act 1 fates is not that huge. You're similarly going to have a deck that's going to have a set of instructions. You're similarly going to have a time goal that you're going to be ticking down. Mm -hmm. Some of the uh, B fates, which are the Act 2 fates, do have this little icon in the bottom left corner of this uh, flagship. And if you take one of those, you can, if you wish, or you must, depending on the, the rules here, abandon your buildings for a flagship. So hmm. what that means is that all of the buildings that you have on the map are going to come off, and if you want to hand me that flagship board. Oh, jeez. Okay. They're going to become upgrades to your flagship. <laughs> and so all of the rules Whoa. for this step are on the back, where it says flagship hmm. setup. And so it says place a loyal flagship, which is this big old ship. Yeah, there's one here, right? Right, this big old ship. Place it in a, a, a system with loyal pieces. Then replace all loyal cities and starports on the map with free cities and starports, respectively. So those cities and starports overthrow your rule. They'll become free. Hmm. Then take a flagship upgrades card. There's a little card that summarizes all the upgrades on flagships. And then flip the board over and place it below your player board. And then there'll be instructions on your card about how many buildings to start with and where to start with them on. Here. Hmm. So the way this flagship works is, um, well... There's a few ways it works, and so we're just going to cover the rules of the flagship now because you may need them. So a flagship uh, has a number of uh, sort of ability slots here. There are six of them. And then it has a number of armor slots, which are above those ability slots. And when you would go to take a build action to build a city, you can instead build buildings onto your flagship. And in fact, you may only build buildings yep. onto your flagship. Mm -hmm. You may not build them onto slots on the board. And so the way it works is... Each of these slots, it may be hard to tell, it has a little resource icon in there. Mm -hmm. And so you can only build into those slots if you're at the same resource type planet. Oh, like if your flagship is located there exactly. at that time. Okay. So, for instance, if you wanted to build at the slipstream drive, you would need to be located at a fuel planet. Got it. Okay. And when you build on this lower slot, what that does is it turns on that ability, which is going to be on that little you know, ability summary guide. And you can't build the armor slot until you've built the base That's ability right. slot. Hmm. When you build onto this board, you can either build a starship a port, sorry, starport, or a city. And cities okay. work the same way. They free up resource slots. They give you extra scoring. But the reason you might want to build a starport on here is that when you're rolling dice, the number of dice you get for this one ship is the number of fresh starports that are on here. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. So that's how you sort of count the, the strength of your of your flagship. And this ship also takes damage, just like a normal ship would. So if it takes a damage, first it will hit an armor slot, and then mm. it can go down to here. And the attacker still gets to choose, mm -hmm. but so that's why you might want to have armor, so they can't take offline certain things. Um, and that's sort of how that works. So, And do they still... Um, 
each building in there still has its two hit points, and do yep. they still take them as trophies if they yes. eliminate them? Okay. Um, you can't target a flagship with ship attacks until there are no other ships. But building attacks go straight through to the flagship. Mm-hmm. So as a, oh, as okay, a flagship yeah, cause, player... Cause you, you won't have other buildings, but you would have other ships. Okay, totally. right, yep, yep. right, right. You will have other ships, exactly. Um, and you can always raid the flagship. So there are some summaries of the rules down here. Um, and then all the abilities are on the little player guide. Do you want to go over the abilities? I, I think we can let if, people if, discover that. Yeah, if there's a problem. decent kind of reference for it, I think we can leave that too. Excellent. There it is. For later. Okay, so that's the main difference with the B-Fates. Not all of them have that. Um, half of them do, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So it's an option in B that's not present in A. And then if you continue with B, right, because if you succeed with B, you can carry B on into the third and final game. You might stick with your flagship or not. Um, but if you're going to go into C, these Cs will not have flagships. Oh, okay. But they do do something a little bit different, and we have an example deck somewhere here. Yes. Um, oh, and just to show you, like this is the Pirate for Act 2, which mm-hmm. is a flagship thing. It says on the on the setup card, you gain a flagship, take a flagship board and set it up. Okay, so you really can't Place miss one it. fresh starport on each of your tractor beam and defense array upgrades. So that's what you start with. Okay, so, so, it, just all right, so it's, it's really explicit. Right, it's very explicit. Okay. And so this is a sea fate, okay? So remember, you will, can get a sea fate either at, at the end of Act Two. If you succeeded on your B fate, you get to choose between persisting with your B fate or transitioning to a sea fate. Mm-hmm. Or if you succeed with your A fate, uh, A fate, the same thing, A or C. Or if you failed, you can get two sea fates and choose. Now the way sea fates are different is that at the end of the game, if you have an A fate or a B fate, well. Well, yeah, let's do this now. So let's say <laughs> you have an A, an A or B fate at the end of the game. At the end of Act 3. At the, at the end, end of the entire sorry, campaign? At the start of Act 3. At the start of Act 3, okay. For, if you're going into Act 3 with an A fate or a B fate, you're going to have an objective card that looks like this. Um, this may be kind of hard to see. You, that doesn't help. But you see this, <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, in any event, um, there are these two conditions on this card of things that you want to achieve. And there will be four chapters instead of three. Uh, three in Acts 1 and 2, four in Act uh, 3. Mm-hmm. And each of the chapters has this little scoring condition right beneath oh. it. 2, 4 for uh, chapter 1, 3, 8, 4, 14, and then 5, 20 for Act 4. And what that's basically saying is you get chapter that four. much... Chapter 4. You get that much power if you've done one or two of your two objectives on your objective card. Mm. In addition to any ambition scoring. And are they generally objectives that you can then lose? Like, can they be true in chapter two and then not true in chapter three? Yes, because like, usually they require you to have or whatever. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, for instance, the Founders Act three conditions are three free cities are neither controlled by the Empire nor a player who is not a Commonwealth member. The Founder introduces a second nation, the Commonwealth. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the second condition is seven free cities that meet that condition. So you can either have one, or if mm-hmm. you have all seven, then you can get the, the higher scoring value. Okay. So, But ultimately, if you're the Founder, you're trying to score power. And there's a new avenue available to you to do that, but you win the game by having the most power. That's and the way all A and B fates work. They all have a card like this with two conditions on it. And that's in addition to ambitions are happening as normal and you started with Something. half the power you ended Act 2 with, right? right so exactly. you kind of have those three main sources to your score? Correct. Okay. Now, if instead you transition to a C fate, the C fates have objectives that look like the A and B fates from Acts 1 and 2, and they meaning time. they have a timer, they have mm. a countdown. And if they reach zero at the end of that chapter, they win. Oh. They just win. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Right. So if someone's in a sea fate, the other players have to, uh, you know, assuming not everyone's in a sea fate, the other players have to both stop them from achieving their condition by going down to zero while also. And vie for power. Vie for, mm-hmm. vie for power. They do have to have positive, they have to have at least one power. I was just going to ask, do they even have a power, uh, so, are they even on the power track? So yes. yeah, there's a couple things with that, because you can actually go negative power hmm. if you are not fulfilling your objective because you lose that power um, at the end of uh, each act. So you could go negative, hmm. they have to dig themselves out of that hole, at least to the positive, to win with their oh, interesting condition. Right. Does, um, if you do end, say, act one with negative power, do you cut that negative in half? No. 
Interesting. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's only people. Who love that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, brutal. Um, and the other thing why power still matters is in a three or four player game, you know, you might have multiple people that are that have these instant win conditions. If multiple people hit their C fate conditions in the same chapter, then the tiebreaker is most power. So you still mm. want to have a lot of power if you're going for these C objectives. Okay. Yeah. Right. And even if you have a C objective, you can still win the game by ending the game with the most power, even if you didn't fulfill your right. condition. Right. You're, you're less likely to because you don't have these extra ways of scoring power, but you could theoretically still win and, by having the most power. By the way, I'm assuming that the, and is this true for the whole campaign, the 27, 30, like the, the thresholds that normally trigger the end of the game, is that thrown out? Yes. You're okay. just going to play through every chapter. The only time the game will end early is after any chapter in Act 3, if a C fate has achieved their Got condition, it. they'll win. Otherwise, you're just playing the number of chapters in the end. Right, exactly. Okay. So we've covered the differences with the B and C fates. Um, Drew, is there anything else we're missing here? I think that's pretty much, pretty I don't, much it. Um, I don't see any components on the table we haven't touched on. Yeah, I mean, I will say there's a lot, while Drew's thinking about it, I'll just vamp. There are a lot of rules interactions that come from these fates and their different abilities. And so there's a lot to like think about there, and obviously we haven't taught you any of that um, because we, you know, it's because we're not going to go. Through, we're not going to go through every single one of those decks. Right. There's, yeah. there's 24 fates in the game, but the framework is still relatively compact mm -hmm. and simple. Yeah. It's just sure. the um, you know the asymmetry of these is massive. We could talk briefly about intermission stuff. We didn't yeah, cover that that's a in good point. detail. So it's and it's nice on this player aid. You kind of walk through between each act about like what happens. So the first part we did talk about, which is resolve fates. So that's where you're gonna resolve your own stack of mm -hmm. cards on that um, resolution card. Um, you'll clear the court. So all of the court cards are gonna go back to the deck, um, and any agents on there would wipe. But then anything in the discard pile is scrapped. So if something was used in the game and sent to the discard pile, mm -hmm. it's out for the rest of the campaign. Oh, scrapped means out, like out, out of the campaign. Good. Okay, yeah. wow. So like if you used a prelude effect. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so then the third thing, you clear pieces. So that includes trophies, captives. Those don't carry over. Um, frozen resources on cards, on uh, the Imperial Trust. And, um, and then next is... Well, notably, you do not clear... If you keep your fate, you do not lose favor. So if you if you get to keep your fate, oh, you get to keep any favor that you've accrued into the next game. Favor, favor being the the, 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 the agents, the that agents from other characters mm -hmm. that go on that card. Okay. Um, so the next thing is repair and destroy pieces. So all of the damaged blight on the board is going to get repaired. So if you don't do oh. a good job of clearing it in Act One, so it starts Act One damaged, but then it repairs. Yeah. Oh, so, brutal. so you're okay. kind of on the clock to like repair, like yeah. remove a lot of it. Otherwise, it's going to be really so it's a co-op game. Act Two, so it can, yeah. it feels like that. Honestly, <laughs> like Act One can feel like a co-op game because you're kind of exploring the map, working together a little bit there. Um, then destroy all damaged ships, buildings, and flagship uh, upgrades. So mm -hmm. any ships you have on the map that are damaged go away. Any buildings uh, that are damaged are going to go away as well. Um, and then if there is blight uh, existing with any buildings that don't have ships like protecting it, mm -hmm. those also wipe. Oh, wow. So blight can be pretty nasty between, uh, between games. Um, yep, and then you'd give uh, initiative to... Whoever has the most power, which we talked about, and that's yeah, we talked about the rest of it. So. Does Blight repopulate over the campaign at all? It yes. or does. So then the other side of this is the setup for, oh, okay. for Acts so. two and three. Mm -hmm. Um so the first thing you do is you'll flip an ambition. So similar to the base game where you flip one every chapter, in Acts two and three, you'll start with one more level up. Oh, flipped. okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the points that escalates the, the point points scale even too. faster, yeah. yeah. Um, it tells you to set up the court, um, and then you're, you're going to add blight to gates. So if uh, a gate has no ships, a blight is just going to show up there at the start of mm -hmm. your next game. And then you're going to roll this die to determine where blight is going to try and populate. So if uh, we had rolled this, um, this arrow symbol, then a damaged blight is going to try to appear at each arrow planet. If there already is one there, then it tries to spread out 
in all of the other systems oh, of that cluster. Yeah, okay. so it's sort of like pandemic, pandemic. style in- kind of including the gate. Or, I mean, I guess the gate's already we're going to get. Uh, yeah, but. Yes, including the gate, because the gate is a system at uh, that cluster. Oh, no, sorry. It is at each planet. It doesn't oh, okay. specify that. Um, and there's some two-player uh, extra rules there, and then you go into your setups and objectives. And cool. I love that this is all just on this nice reference yeah. card, so you don't yeah, actually have very, to dig through the rule book. Very for easy it. Yeah. to, yeah. to yeah. run through that. Yeah. And then we'll, we should just show this one off, too, in case we haven't, but like, this one has the Empire rules about command, oh, okay. movement, battle harm. Mm-hmm. The council rules, and on this side, it's the summit, and then the blight. And the oh, okay. Yeah, that's so super handy. These are really good, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, good job, Drew. I think the only other thing that you've mentioned to me before that we haven't touched on here is, do you want to say anything about what to do if you're saving the campaign for another time? Sure. Um, so, if Drew wants to grab this like little and, setup thing. And we haven't touched on the campaign log sheet either. Yeah, so there is this log here. Um, you use one sheet for a whole campaign. On it, it has um, the player color, uh, uh, so you write the name of the player here. This is the fate they had in their power score. Mm. And then on the back of this, um, you can indicate, um, A, like what resources players have uh, in fate one. And then if you're going into two, you can indicate, like, if, uh, sorry, if you're ending look. two, you can indicate what flagship upgrade someone mm. has. You can save that information here. Um, and yeah, and you know it's for three, so it's a pretty free form. Mm-hmm. And then as far as stuff on the board, um, they provided two of these trays, um, which are coded with a number and a symbol, so that covers all of the spaces on the map. For instance, mm-hmm. this is three moon, so... And there's a spot for that in the... There's a spot for that, yeah. So you just pick up all the pieces you just throw in all the thing, components and then just in there. put them in each square, right. and then set up is, is really easy. And yeah, I've never seen that before, that's really clever. Mm-hmm. And you know that anything that goes in is going to come out fresh. Because all the ships will be... All the blight will have repaired. And all of the ships that were damaged oh, will die. Because the, the spreading spreading damage blight, that's part of the setup for the next game. Right. So that would, you would not do that before saving. Right. Right. So it. everything that comes out of the save file is fresh. Okay. Awesome. This is exciting. Yeah. I'm looking forward to playing it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. It'll be... Uh, I'm... I'm I'm already like the the blind and everything. It seems so specific that part of me is like they've got to have three other ideas for campaigns they in, definitely the, in the tank least that one. is like yeah. not not about blight. It just does something different with mm-hmm. the board or or new board or or whatever. Um, but yeah, very cool game system. Uh, well, thank you for teaching me. Yeah. Uh, thank you both. Yeah. D- Drew, uh, fill in the gaps. Um, thank you for watching. Uh, we have a like button and a subscribe button if you want to use it. And uh, did we already say on this video that you are on a podcast? I don't, I don't know. I don't think we did. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if you enjoyed hearing Jordan explain a complicated game and want to hear him do that more often, you can check out the Game Brain podcast uh, where he does so regularly and gives his opinions on them and has discussions, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Drew might cameo on there soon. Otherwise, yeah. few if any podcasts where you can find Drew, yeah. sadly. For now. Yeah. Yeah, someday. Cool. Well, uh, we do have a playthrough of base game arcs also on the channel, and uh, I think we will likely, um, I'm not going to make any timeline promises, but we will likely play the campaign at some point too. So, yeah. I mean, I'll make a timeline promise for me and Drew, but not for the stream. (laughs) <laughs> we'll be playing the campaign game tomorrow <laughs> oh, are, do you really have plans to play more arcs tomorrow yeah. of course you do of course you do if that gives you any indication of how much we love this game yeah. alright well then we better wrap this up so that you can get some sleep <laughs> in between arcs sure. games yeah. alright thank you both <laughs> thank you for watching till next time be optimal